Good morning. Welcome to the Colorado edition of our state webinar series, exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States. Before we get started, let me run through some quick logistics. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow at the top of that panel allows the panel to open and shrink. You'll see a question section of that panel. You can pop that section out by clicking on the little square on the right-hand side. That decouples it from the control panel. You can then type your question or comment into that panel. We will see it and we will be allowing plenty of time for Q&A. We're also recording the webinar and we'll send the link to everyone who has registered. Please feel free to share this recording with others. So let me now introduce myself. I'm Chris Coffin, American Farmland Trust's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our recently launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me is Billy Van Pelt. Billy is AFT's Director of External Relations. For those of you not familiar with American Farmland Trust, let me do a very quick introduction. We are a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We believe that saving the land that sustains us means focusing not just on retaining and protecting the agricultural land base, but also on the management of that land and on the farmers, ranchers, and landowners who work the land. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress, from land protection projects to soil health and water quality initiatives to training service providers to help a new generation of farmers and ranchers gain access to land. Our programming and research inform our state and federal policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, DC. So let me now turn it over to Billy. Thanks, Chris. We are delighted to be joined today by a number of valued partners, including the Colorado Department of Agriculture, Colorado State University, Pueblo Food Project, Cold Harbor Institute, Hunger Free Colorado, Boulder Food Rescue, Valley Food Partnership, the National Western Center, the Conservation Fund, Colorado Open Lands, the Colorado Beef Council, and numerous farmers, ranchers, and county officials from across the state. Thank you all for joining us today. We would like to recognize USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service and to thank them, especially for their collaboration and support of this project. They've been an integral partner, as has our research partner in this project, Conservation Science Partners. And now I would like to welcome our very special guest, Commissioner of the Colorado Department of Agriculture, Kate Greenberg. Thank you so much for joining us, Commissioner. We know your schedule is very busy, so we appreciate you making the time for us this morning. We thought that we would ask you a few questions. So I'll start with, why should people in Colorado care about the loss of farm and ranch land? Thanks, Billy, and thank you, Chris, for the invite. It's a pleasure to be on the call this morning. I'm glad we were able to make it happen and um, look forward to the conversation today. So, I mean, I think for the folks on the phone, I would imagine are here because they care deeply about agriculture. And of course, farmland and working lands are integral to what agriculture is. Um, in Colorado, ag is one of our primary economic drivers. Uh, it's part of the landscape from, of course, the Eastern Plains, where we have the bulk of our production uh, through the high country uh, and over to the Western Slope, Southern Colorado, Southeast, Southwest. I mean, all of the different regions in our state, um, in even our urban corridor around the Front Range is what it is and looks how it looks and has the beauty that it has because of agriculture. You know, I think for for folks who don't necessarily have as a, a direct connection to ag as, as the folks on the phone, um, I assume do, there's so much of Colorado, uh, our way of life, our, our scenery, 
um, what we get to experience by living here that is what it is because of working lands, because of agricultural land. That connection isn't always clear, but it is absolutely fundamental to uh, who and what Colorado is. And so much of that, of course, also comes back to water out here in the West and the importance of keeping water on the land and in agricultural production. You know, there's another um, important connection, of course, which is local food and, and the ability for consumers to have a direct relationship with their farmers and ranchers, uh, working lands in the state of Colorado are integral to that relationship, which of course, not just keeps working lands working, but keeps uh, market opportunities growing uh, for Colorado ag. Thank you, Commissioner. Colorado has a strong commitment to protecting its agricultural land base, and that commitment is clearly seen in our policy scorecard. From a policy standpoint, standpoint, what do you attribute this success to? Well, I think it's attributed to a number of things, but you know, fundamentally, it, I, from what I've seen, it's from the ground up. What the success in Colorado really comes through uh, very grassroots efforts and collaborations with producers with local land trusts and conservation organizations, um, with GOCO, our, you know, our state uh, funding source, primary funding source for farmland conservation. Of course, we have the conservation easement tax credit here. All of this has been built um, really in a nonpartisan uh, effort, a coalition really statewide where you know, our community, our ag community has joined forces with the conservation community recognizing our shared values of keeping ag land in production, of keeping uh, production local here in Colorado, keeping our farmers and ranchers alive and thriving on the land and, and able to access uh, markets that support them in, in continued ag production, not just throughout a, you know, a single producer's lifetime, but through generations. And I think that shared value and our ability to come together uh, across perceived differences to work towards shared goals is invaluable for us here in Colorado. And then of course, you know, so much of who we are in Colorado has to do with our landscape. And it's not just the, the Rocky Mountains, it's every uh, piece of irrigated or even dry land, uh, you know, ag production out there that folks drive through when they're coming to visit, when they're on trips, when they're, you know, going out to wine country in Western Colorado. Every, every strip of land that someone drives through is uh, the, that, like I mentioned before, that natural beauty is maintained in such large part because of the ability to preserve working lands and, and keep working people on the land. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Um, even with this success, Colorado, uh, like other states across the nation, continues to convert farm and ranch land to urban and low density residential development. In your opinion, what more can the state do and what can stakeholders do in order to um, help facilitate the listening and to keep this issue front and center with policymakers and the public? Well, for one, I think it's critical to keep telling the story um, to all local, state, federal elected officials who have the power to make decisions about what the future of our working lands looks like. I think finding much like, you know, I was just discussing with, with finding unlikely allies, I think we just have to continue doing that, seeing our shared goals and, and shared visions across perceived differences, finding unlikely allies and building really diverse and dynamic and strong coalitions to keep the pressure on. And, and now I, I am a public official. And so I say that having, you know, worked on issues of farmland conservation with the National Young Farmers Coalition on the advocacy side, um, you know, trying to keep the pressure on, on folks who now serve in the position I'm serving in. And it's it, the same holds true from this side of the equation, um, finding those coalitions, building those coalitions uh, is really integral. You know, I think part of this too is, is really supporting counties, um, even at the local level on their open space support. That's a huge um, point of leverage for protecting uh, working lands. Of course, here are state level programs. I mentioned GOCO and our tax credit program. There's a lot of other opportunities at the state level for us to move on. Um, federal advocacy is huge. Of course, you know, the Farm Bill has a number of provisions, in, especially ASAP, 
uh, that that provide funding for working lands uh, protection. I think that's a certainly a place to to stay strong on. Um, in addition, you know, CDA, the Department of Ag here in Colorado, we're a part of an interagency task force on natural and working lands. So we're really driving from the from the agency side in partnership with um, non-governmental stakeholders, really driving how we put ag lands, working lands at the forefront of the fight against climate change, how we build resilience as a state while upholding um, you know, our agricultural base. Um, it's really not an either or, it's really a question of how do we uh, leverage the leadership in agriculture to drive the state toward uh, our larger goals. You know, at CDA, we also operate a uh, Colorado Ag Mediation Program. So we help support farm and ranch families in succession planning. This is another huge equation where if a you know, family is faced with some pretty tough financial choices, especially you know, given the economic realities we're in right now, if the next generation doesn't want to take over or isn't prepared to, then that farm or ranch family has a lot of hard decisions to make. We want to provide more options for our ag families to keep their land and business in agriculture. And that might look you know, much more diverse, uh, more different than in years past. I mean, we've seen more models of families transitioning land outside of the family, um, you know, to, to young farmers or ranchers who are ready to take over, uh, or maybe there's other unique, uh, you know, models for, for ways to keep land and ag, but really we don't want farm families to have to sell if they don't want to, if there's a way to remain financially successful and sustainable uh, in agriculture. And then, you know, lastly, we at CDA, we serve on the Conservation Easement Oversight Commission. Um, so while we don't house any of these programs, GOCO or the tax credit or the commission at CDA, we play a really important uh, advocacy role within uh, state government. So there's plenty more to be done as of course your work shows. Um, we continue to lose ag land at an alarming rate. And as I mentioned, water, not just development on site, but the potential for continued removal of water from the land remain uh, real threats to um, our ag land base in Colorado. So there's there's much, much more to be done. And I know many folks on the call are, are working day and night to make that happen, but CDA certainly sees this as a priority and uh, looks forward to much good work ahead. Thanks so much, Commissioner. We want to thank you again for your leadership and look forward to continuing to work with you on furthering farm and ranch land retention and protection in Colorado. And I'll turn it back over to Chris. Great. Um, thank you so much, Billy. And thank you so much, um, Commissioner. You make some really good points. Um, and I know that your leadership has been terrific at the department and we thank you for what you do. So let's now turn to the findings from this report. Today we're focused on State of the States, which is the second in this research series. It paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state, and it documents the steps every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. We used a multi-pronged approach. This um, included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to the agricultural land base and an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. We're using this report to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. For those of you who didn't join our launch events um, in May, I wanna to touch very quickly on the national findings. You can see here um, that we looked at the time period 2001 to 2016. This was a period of historically low housing starts with a deep recession in the middle. Despite that, the US converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. That's equivalent to all the land planted in the US to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was to low density residential land use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country, scattered large lot housing has been fragmenting and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we realized just how big of a threat it is. 
Significantly, more than 4.4 million acres of the land converted was what we have identified as nationally significant land. That's land that is best suited for intensive food and crop production. As you can see from this next map, agricultural land conversion is a growing problem across the U.S. It's no longer confined to large metropolitan areas. Small cities are sprawling and the proliferation of farmettes and ranchettes on their outskirts has created hotspots of conversion in virtually every state. So now we're gonna dive into the data available for Colorado on this new interactive website we've created. We do this in part to encourage people to go to the website and to see what tools are available through it. So we're gonna start here with the tab on the right, the reports and data tab. Um, and I should say we're being ably assisted today by Beth Fraser, who is helping us uh, guide us through this um, website. So thank you, Beth. So we're going to start with the reports and data tab over here. And in under here, you can find the full report. You can find the full scorecard. You can find all of the technical reports that explain the methodology between both the spatial analysis and the policy scorecard. And importantly here, where Beth has the pointer, this geospatial data layers is where you would find a form if you would like to receive any of the data layers that we used in this report. We are making them available, so go to that, fill out a form, and we'll be back in touch telling you what is available and when it'll be available. So now we're going to go to Colorado. Here you go to select the state, to the drop down menu, and you pick Colorado. And from here, you can access both the spatial data and the policy scorecard. We're going to start with the spatial data, and Beth is first going to show us this download Colorado conversion summary down here on the left-hand side. And this is a nifty two-page PDF. There is also an equivalent one on the policy scorecard that we hope people will be able to easily download and use for a number of different purposes, whether it's putting some of the infographics into a newsletter or sending it to policymakers or to journalists. Um, we can think of any number of uses. We hope that you find it helpful in your work. Um, and again, you can find the, the policy equivalent under the policy scorecard that we'll go to in a minute. So now we're gonna look at the four categories of spatial data. We're gonna start with land cover and use. We used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land use in the US. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including land that we've identified as low density residential development. And that is the orange, um, the sort of medium orange colors there. It uh, also includes federal land permitted for grazing and a first ever attempt to spatially identify woodland associated with a ranch or a farm. Our mapping shows 32.58 million acres of agricultural land in Colorado, including 23.26 million acres of rangeland, 7.85 million acres of cropland, 1.33 million acres of pasture, and 141,000 acres of woodland, again, that's associated with a farm or a ranch. So now we're gonna to move to PDR values. For this report, we wanted to analyze the quality of land that is being lost to development, not just the quantity. So we created, with the help of a national panel of experts, an index to quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the US. This map shows the range of these PBR values across the state. The darker the green, the higher the PBR value, and the higher the PBR value, the higher the suitability of the land for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. And just um, a point on this that you can see in the land cover and use, you might have noticed that we have, um, in some of the maps, we pull out the PBR values on rangeland separately from cropland and pasture land. This one shows the range of the uh, PBR values combined on all of the agricultural land categories. 
So we took these PVR values and created um, a subcategory which we are calling nationally significant land. So this next map shows that nationally significant land in Colorado. There's about 5.62 million acres that fall into this category, which is 17% of the state's ag land base. Virtually all of this is cropland, about 5.58 million acres, with 21,000 acres of rangeland and 16,000 in pasture. The last category we're going to look at is conversion. So again, this is a 15-year period from 2001 to 2016. We mapped the conversion to two types of land use. The first, urban and highly developed land use, includes traditional culprits and farmland conversion. So that's expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas, typically around the edge of cities and towns, but it also includes rural, industrial, and energy production sites, including oil and gas well pads and solar installations. The second type is low density residential development, which we'll refer to as LDR. These areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. Colorado's conversion trend looks slightly different than the majority of states in that it had more conversion to urban and highly developed land over this time frame than to LDR. 53% of conversion or 124,000 acres was conversion to urban and highly developed land use, and uh, slightly under 111,000 acres were converted to low density um, residential land use. And a note here about this LDR, there may be some active agriculture on land designated as LDR, and some of these small parcels may be highly productive and profitable but we know that LDR tends to be a transitional land use. Land in Colorado, for instance, that was considered LDR in 2001 was 60 times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2016 than other agricultural land. And we know that continued conversion to LDR creates management challenges for producers who have to adjust to farming in and around non-farm neighbors. So total ag land converted over this period was just shy of 235,000 acres. Rangeland accounted for two thirds of the conversion, followed by cropland with 63,600 acres, followed by pasture with 15,000 acres, and just about 1,000 acres of woodlands. Looking at the PVR values of the land converted, about 48% of the conversion was on land that had PVR values in the upper half of the state's range of PVR values. So with that, let me stop and turn it over to Billy and the commissioner for some perspectives on what we're seeing spatially. Commissioner, would you like to go first? Sure, happy to. Uh, thanks for this presentation, Chris. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm, I have not yet dug deep into the data and I look forward to doing so, but I think that the trends we see while Colorado might uh, have a bit of a better scorecard than other states, um, we certainly, what your maps show, um, I think a lot of us on the ground here see every day as we drive through uh, parts of the state that, you know, not long ago were working lands, working farms and ranches, and now are, are subdevelopments. And that, of course, is true as we see the cluster along the front range, uh, but it's not the only place, as you mentioned, um, that we see this conversion. And again, um, you know, from my vantage point, none of this uh, can go without talking about water and the importance of uh, protecting working lands with uh, the water for the land. So, you know, this this data is incredibly helpful for us at CDA and certainly our other state partners who um, operate our farmland conservation programs to really um, get nuance in terms of how we address and respond to the ongoing conversion of working lands. Again, to, to my points earlier, our working lands, whether our, you know, our over 5 million residents in Colorado know it or not, are absolutely integral to what makes Colorado, Colorado. And the data that you have here, I think will help us 
uh, help inform our decision making to a much greater extent as we move forward to to keep uh, the foundation of agriculture strong, which is our, our land and water and our people. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'll just add a few brief comments is what you're seeing here, as Chris mentioned, this is the conversion over a 15 year period. So um, if I could ask my colleague Beth to zoom in a bit on the area north of Denver, uh, when you see conversion along the spectrum of development from low density residential to urban high density, you start to see the fragmentation within your PBR um, farmland and ranch land. And the more fragmentation that you have, the less likely is those areas will be able to sustain agriculture long term. This is not unique to Colorado. We're seeing this across the country. The other trend that we're seeing is that smaller communities, municipalities, and cities that have um, a high rate of conversion start merging together. And these, these areas of sprawl become more and more urbanized and become one larger urban area. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the suite of tools used to conserve farmland and plan for the future of agriculture a little bit later in the webinar. Great, thank you, Billy. Um, and I know, Commissioner, you need to go shortly, so we just want to say thank you again for joining us. And um, and the very quick piece on the policy scorecard, since we'll be talking about that next, is um, that Colorado has been doing a very good job, and basically the message is we can't take our foot off the accelerator um, and the importance of, and thinking about as you have been and as you've talked about, thinking about the other tools, the tools around generational transfer of land and thinking about um, soil health and the availability of water, um, which we know are critically important. So thank you again. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. And we know that there are de other department staff who are staying with us on the webinar and we're grateful for them and we'll look to them to help us with any questions. So with that, before we go to the scorecard, we wanna stop and get a little bit of input from all of you. We're interested in your perspectives on what you think will drive agricultural land conversion over the next 10 to 20 years in Colorado. And we put that here because as we, talk about the policy scorecard, thinking about what those drivers are um, helps to figure out where the policy emphasis needs to be. And I recognize here that we do not have something that says water availability and understanding how critical that is to agriculture in Colorado. So if you feel that that is the biggest driver, please feel free to write that in. It's helpful to know that if people think that. Um, so let me take a minute and let people vote. If you're having trouble voting, um, it may be that you were in full screen mode, in which case you need to come out of that full screen mode to vote and then you can go back in. Okay, Beth, what are we seeing here? This is very useful um, in formation, and I'm looking at it because we've now done many of these webinars around um, in other states, and with one exception, um, you all think much like your colleagues in other states in terms of both the continued concern about more and poorly planned development 
Um, but the growing concern around generational transfer and here the concern about climate change, which I'm guessing in some cases might also be linked to the question of water availability. Um, so this is helpful to be to end, and I should not discount this um, relatively high number around weak agricultural viability and AFT does recognize that having profitable farms and ranches is one of the best ways to keep land and agriculture. So needing to always focus on um, the viability aspects of agriculture. So let's turn to policy. Our intent with the scorecard is to highlight effective elements of state policies that address these historical drivers of agricultural land conversion. And while AFT has been engaged in policy development since our founding, this is our first effort at a state policy scorecard. We know that there are many ways that states support agriculture. We know this is true in Colorado. The Colorado Department of Agriculture is doing many good things, many of which fall outside um, the purview of the scorecard. We didn't attempt to score them all. Instead, we focused on six different types of policies and programs that tie directly to the land. So these include the purchase, you can see these over on the left-hand side, the purchase of agricultural conservation easement or PDR programs. So voluntary farmland preservation programs that compensate landowners who choose to place an agricultural conservation easement on their property. So we looked at GOCO um, in Colorado. For land use planning, most states, including Colorado, delegate planning authority to local governments. However, states can play a more active role, requiring localities to develop comprehensive plans, identify agricultural resources, and adopt policies to protect them. So we looked at what states were doing in this category. We looked at property tax relief. Every state in the country has a program of some kind to reduce property taxes paid on agricultural land in recognition that working lands require far less in municipal services than does residential development. These programs, though, vary in administration and their focus on agricultural land rete retention. And so there's some sort of bells and whistles that we looked at here. Um, uh, agricultural district programs, not something that Colorado has. There are 14 states with them. They encourage landowners to form special areas to support agriculture. The protections and incentives offered through the programs differ by state. Some protect agricultural landowners with li by limiting annexation that can happen in a district or limit eminent domain use in a district or provide protection from the siting of public facilities and infrastructure. Some offer additional tax incentives to landowners in districts. Some require district enrollment to participate in state administered PACE programs. Then we looked at two that were really focused on land access and generational transfer. We looked at farm link programs. So those that connect land seekers with landowners who want their land to stay in agriculture. These are administered by public or private entities. They offer a range of services from online real estate postings to technical assistance, trainings, and educational ones. And a note here, we only included publicly supported programs. We know that there is a Colorado land link. And as the commissioner said, there were some things that sort of did not fit easily into here. And so we did not include ag mediation programs because again, many of them don't focus. And we commend Colorado for focusing um, more than many on um, that generational transfer and working with landowners on those succession strategies. And then lastly, we looked at state leasing. Um, those are state programs that make state-owned land available to farmers and ranchers for agriculture. Sometimes that's their primary purpose, but more often agricultural use is secondary to protecting wildlife habitat or generating income for a public purpose. So with that, let's look at how Colorado scores relative to other states, and that is well above the median for PACE. <laughs> planning and state leasing, a little below the median for property tax relief. And again, um, no score here on the ag districts, not a program and farm link again, because 
the while we recognize that there are other activities, there's not anything that sort of fell in line with what we considered to be state support for farm link programs. Um, let me make an important here, another important point here about what was not included. We didn't include conservation easement tax credits, and that was in part because it's difficult to parse out how much land protected with the help of state tax credits ha ha is agricultural land protected for agricultural use. We're working on that now and hope to include them in our next iteration of the scorecard, but we recognize that Colorado and several other states um, use these credits and they represent a significant state investment in land conservation. So again, we want to give you guys props for doing that because it is incredibly valuable. Um, we also didn't include things like beginning farmer and rancher tax credits or several other innovative programs helped focused on helping next generation producers finance and gain access to land. And so we also didn't look at things like Colorado's Ag Workforce Development Program, which again, we see as something that is innovative and useful, but we had only so much time and bandwidth and uh, we focused on these particular six policies and hope to do more in the future. So we're now gonna look at a couple of these in detail and you can go to the Select Policy and Program tab and we're gonna start with PACE. Um, you can see here the GOCO ranks seventh amongst state PACE programs, which is impressive, particularly given the size of Colorado relative to the other states that are above it. The only place where it doesn't get points is for easement terms and conditions intended to promote agricultural use and ownership of protected land. So through mechanisms like an affirmative covenant to farm or an option to purchase an agricultural value, and maybe that's something that Colorado might want to consider. I do want to take a quick moment to talk about the importance of matching funds through the Federal Agricultural Conservation Easement Program and the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. These are both USDA NRCS programs. We hope that the changes that we advocated for in the 2018 Farm Bill increased funding, some key statutory changes to both will make their use more, um, uh, make them more used, more utilized in Colorado as elsewhere. And through the network, we are hoping to have further conversations with folks about how to make those programs work as effectively and efficiently as possible. So next, let's go to land use planning. Colorado is not quite as high up on the boards here on this category. It gets points for requiring comprehensive planning and some points for providing some technical assistance around those comp plans. States that score higher here have specific state goals around both compact development and retaining their agricultural land base and incentivize or require consistency between those local comprehensive plans and those state goals. On property tax relief, Colorado gets um, good marks for the amount of land enrolled in agricultural use assessment or current use assessment. States that scored higher in this category impose withdrawal penalties on landowners who take land out of similar programs in other states or convert land earlier um, than under the program, convert it to development within a certain time period. Some states use those withdrawal penalties and fees to help fund state and local farmland protection efforts and programs. And then lastly, let's look at state leasing. Colorado shines here. Um, it ranks fourth in the country in part because of the amount of land leased, but in part because of the transparent process that it uses, the land management practices it encourages on state-owned land, and the fact that the state land board incentivizes the transfer of leases to younger producers. Um, I guess my only question in looking at this scorecard is whether the state owns lands that is outside of the state land board's jurisdiction, whether there is, for instance, land that is state owned that is owned by 
are managed by other agencies that are not land resource related and whether there's any opportunity for additional state-owned land that could be used for particularly smaller parcel farming in and near urban areas. So I hope that was a helpful cruise through the findings. If you have questions, please um, write them down now. As we go out of the website, we're going to launch a poll which asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to focus on for Colorado. I apologize that we weren't able to fit in the state-owned land or farm link into here. Um, if you feel that either of those two are the most important or that there's some other um, initiative that you feel is more important, please feel free to write them in in the question panel. And we'll take a minute to see how everyone votes. Great, thanks. Let's see what we're doing here. All right, um, uh, this is useful to know that both there is a strong interest in continuing to push on permanent easements and an equally strong emphasis on land use planning. Um, I will say that the National Agricultural Land Network is going to be doing a series of policy webinars beginning in early fall where we're going to dig into each one of these elements and really talk about what, what makes for, what are the states that were at the top of the boards, what are they doing in land use planning that really other states can learn from, and we'll have one whole webinar on land use planning, or more than one, um, and one on PACE programs and what makes for the most successful PACE program. Um, so I hope that people who are interested in, in digging in more on state policy will join us for those. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. The one data layer that we were not able to include was protected agricultural land. That's because there's no comprehensive um, data layer of easements specific to agriculture. It is great to see Colorado and the green that, um, that lights up um, in the state on here. So we do have a lot of data. If you are an entity that holds ag conservation easements and you are have not heard from us, please let us know by putting your name in the um, question panel and we will be in touch to get that data from you. So with that, Billy, let me, um, let me stop and see if there are questions. Thanks, Chris. And I wanna be mindful of everyone's time and we'll start at the top with our questions. Um, the first question, do PBR values take into account the source and reliability of water resources, or is it just a surface soil evaluation? Chris? Yep, thanks. Um, they do not take into account the source of water. And again, we appreciate that this is um, a very important thing for many Western states particularly. Um, we are working on a phase three of Farms Under Threat that is predictive. As part of that process, we are looking to see how we can include um, issues around water availability more thoroughly um, in our analysis of PBR. And we have been working at the state level in California on some modeling around water availability. So our work continues there. We appreciate that it is an important topic, but no, this does not include the source. In terms of the PBR values, it doesn't look at the source of the water. Thanks, Chris. Uh, at this time, I'd like to move on in the presentation and share with those on the webinar on uh, this next slide that time is not on our side in saving our farm and ranch land, which is why American Farmland Trust just announced a bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040 and reducing the rate of farmland conversion 
from 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day by 2040. We know that to get to this goal, we will need to lock arms with as many partners and practitioners on this call and others around the United States who are deeply concerned about saving the land that sustains us. So we hope that you will all be part of this movement as well. I'd now like to discuss some of the ways that American Farmland Trust will be strengthening its commitment to farmland protection and specifically how they will impact Colorado. Number one, establishing the National Ag Land Network. Through the new National Agricultural Land Network, American Farmland Trust is committed to providing the technical assistance, education, policy development, and research activities to help all farmland protection practitioners thrive. We hope to foster beneficial relationships between farmland protection professionals from small land trust conservation districts to state level programs and all efforts in between. Providing new leadership in key locations, we are increasing our staff capacity to focus on farmland protection, policy, and education. We want to protect more farmland ourselves and with partners. We are partnering with other land trusts and interested conservation organizations to increase the number of protected acres in the state and the conservation practices implemented on those acres as well as access to farmland that's facilitated by permanent protection. If you're interested in learning more about this effort, please let me know. Advocating for stronger in state, state and federal policies, enacting farmland protection policies at any level requires a bipartisan coalition and active community engagement. We also want to promote research-based decision-making. We plan to use the findings from Farms Under Threat to guide our activities on the ground. We are actively building on this research by projecting future threats from development and climate change out to 2040. So you'll be hearing more about Farms Under Threat Phase 3 in the coming days. And if we could have our next slide, please. So we want, what more can Colorado do? We want to encourage all of you to use this data to access our microsite, to analyze and map agricultural land trends and conditions, to strengthen or adopt a coordinated suite of policies. And I'll spend just a bit of time here, I will say, that Colorado is way ahead in developing um, policies and growth uh, management tools that help protect farmland without question, and in many ways pave the way for other communities around the nation to model themselves. But generally speaking, um, what we're seeing across the nation is that communities, municipalities, and cities should have a goal for farmland protection embedded in their comprehensive plans. Urban growth boundaries and urban service areas, very important, and we know you're familiar with this concept from your experience in Colorado, but this applies to cities and municipalities of all sizes to prevent sprawl in the future. Agricultural zoning in rural areas is critical so that you have zoning that encourages agricultural uses but prohibits non-agricultural uses. Lot minimums in rural areas, and that's what we're specifically talking about with low density residential. Lot minimums should be established as part of a broad community conversation in the comprehensive planning process to determine what a viable agricultural unit is to prevent the future proliferation of low density residential and sprawl. And then farmland protection, which clearly um, exists in Colorado, but having that farmland protection at the state level, as well as local PACE and PDR programs 
working alongside land trusts. So planning for agriculture, not just around it and saving the best, but not forgetting the rest. This is all about planning for the future of agriculture. And when you're planning for the future of agriculture, you're planning for the future of the um, ag economy, agribusiness, agritourism. And in Colorado, 7.5 billion in cash farm receipts, 1.7 billion in ag exports, over 70,000 producers, over 40,000 farm labor. So it's critically important to plan for the future of agriculture. And I'll turn it back over to Chris. Great, thank you, Billy. Um, so we do have quite a number of um, comments and questions. There, is, there are a couple of ones that relate to land ownership, particularly about interest in um, what information we have related to land ownership or land loss of um, land owned by people of color. Um, and the short answer is that for this project, um, we, we did not look at that. We did not look at ownership. It is something in terms of ownership trends that we are very interested in. And the broader question, which I think is motivated in some of these comments is, the increase, the need for um, land access around um, for farmers of color particularly. And this is something that Amer American Farmland Trust um, would like to do more work in. We have been focusing some of these efforts in California particularly. Again, since we don't have boots on the ground in every state, I would say that we would love to work with organizations in Colorado, and we would, um, if there are things and places where you think we can be helpful. I think our focus on expanding land access opportunities is probably mostly focused at the policy level nationally, um, but if folks want to reach out to us and have a longer conversation, we would welcome that because it is an area where we feel we need to do more. Um, there's a question here that says, can you speak to policy around farming methods and their impact on farms remaining viable? Example, high cost of inputs on conventional farms versus low co cost of inputs on regenerative ag farms. Yes, we can speak to that. And if you go to our website, farmland.org, you will see that we have done a number of case studies of soil health practices and what it is meant to the economics of various types of farm and ranch operations um, and those farms and ranches that have adopted different types of soil health and regenerative ag practices. So that is an area that we are working on, trying to show that in fact it makes economic sense to focus on soil health and that we are doing much more of this research um, and outreach to producers to um, try and show how that is possible. Um, let me, given what time it is, let me take a minute um, to launch our last poll. Before I do that, actually, I'm looking at these um, questions. There's a question, will we be able to get a copy of the presentation? The slides have been fantastic. Um, we will make, um, we will be providing the recording. I don't see any reason why, and I think we have provided the slides as well, but we will be sure to do that. And so with that, let me turn to this last slide here and talk for a minute about the Farmland Information Center and the national network that I've been referencing. So the Farmland Information Center is a collaboration we've had with USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service for decades. It is a national clearinghouse of information around agricultural land retention and protection. It is geared not just to practitioners, um, like most of us who are on the phone, but to producers and landowners as well. So for instance, if you have 
um, uh, landowners who are interested in understanding what is a basic agricultural conservation easement, um, why should we think about doing this, we have fact sheets around that. We have information for landowners specific to the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, or ASEP. We have resources about how you can find, if you're a producer, how you can find a land trust to work with to protect your ranch or your farm. That's the Farmland Protection Directory as part of our Farmland Information Center. And if you're a practitioner and you have questions about state policy or a statistic that relates to number of, in fact, these ownership questions about um, and land loss, and percents of by people of color, my guess is that the Farmland Information Center could help to find that information. So it's something to ask them about. You can ask them by going online and there's a link there that says ask an expert or there's a call in number. So I really encourage people to look at that resource um, and to use it. The National Agricultural Network is a newly launched network um, that the intent is to build the collective capacity of all of us working to save farm and ranch land to be able to do it more effectively, to do more of it, to link it to other goals, whether that's around land access or climate or soil health. We have a lot that we can all learn from each other and the network is looking to be able to try and provide that peer networking and technical support. So if you are interested in joining, um, I hope you'll consider it. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. You see my email there um, and with that, I guess, Billy, I will um, turn it back to you. Thank you, Chris. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and just add one more comment about the question of growth and farmland protection. If you'll go to our website, uh, farmlandinfo.org, and go to the search field and type in cost of community services, um, American Farmland Trust has done over 80 cost of community services studies across the nation. And generally they, they say um, basically the same things. The findings are very similar. Sprawl uses more in services than it pays in taxes and ag uses less in services than it pays in taxes. And your core urban areas are using even less. But even though ag in your core urban areas are creating a gain on the tax dollar, sprawl is exceeding that. And it is, it is not a sustainable model. I think um, that is well known, but please check out those studies that AFT has done across the country. If you'd like to reach me, I'm available at bvanpelt at farmland.org. I'm also available on LinkedIn if you'd like to send me an invitation to connect. And as my colleague Beth Frazier said, and Chris said earlier, you will be receiving a follow-up email with information about this webinar, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.